Hi everyone, my name is Michael Keogh. I'm a senior staff site reliability engineer at LinkedIn. And today's session, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, BGP, which is uh, the backbone of the internet. Um, if you were here for the previous session with Dinesh, um, this is sort of a good follow-on talk. Um, so today I've got 30 minutes to try and explain something that it takes people years to study and master. So uh, lock yourselves in. So I'll do a quick introduction. We'll talk about the basics of BGP, what it is. We'll talk about the history, how it evolved. And then we'll go into the uh, details of um, how it works, what the protocol looks like, how routing tables are built. Um, and then we'll quickly sum up and hopefully we'll have a few minutes for Q&A. So as I said, um, I'm Michael. I'm from uh, LinkedIn. I work on an um, infrastructure SRE team. So I'm a part of the team that builds a lot of the common platforms uh, for our LinkedIn engineering team. Uh, LinkedIn engineering team. Um, over the last couple of years, I've worked on a large number of things. So uh, networks, microservices, worked on our traffic and edge stack, and also spent some time with one of our database teams. All right, so let's dive in. What is BGP? So Cloudflare call BGP the postal service of the internet. Uh, Jeremy Ciaro of, of CBT describes it as the slowest routing protocol in the world, and we'll come to why that is. Um, but ironically, it's probably this uh, definition from Wikipedia that uh, sums it up uh, in sort of a nice and concise way. So BGP is a standardized exterior gateway protocol designed to exchange routing and reachability information uh, among autonomous systems on the internet. Uh, the BGP protocol makes routing decisions based on paths, network policies, or rule sets configured by the network administrator uh, and then is involved in making core routing decisions. All right, so that's a lot to unpack. So uh, let's talk about some of the basics. So BGP is an exterior gateway protocol. So that means it is designed to connect between different organizations. Um, I'm sure most of you in your home networks uh, use RIP, um, which is the routing uh, internet protocol. That's very old. Uh, it's not designed uh, for scaling to the internet. Um, BGP is. Um, it's a non-converging protocol. Um, but it does enable this um, exter uh, exterior uh, connection between different organizations at scale. So BGP exchanges routing and reachability information about uh, ASs or autonomous systems, and I'll explain them um, in a second, um, and the public internet. Um, BGP is, can also be used to connect peers within an AS uh, and can be also used as an interior gateway protocol. So if you look at uh, the networks for many of the hyperscalers, they're using BGP within their networks uh, to do routing and discovery. And this is, this is very common um, also among uh, service providers and ISPs. Um, probably most importantly, BGP is a path vector protocol, meaning that the path information between a source and a destination is maintained and gets updated uh, dynamically. And following on from Dinesh's talk, um, BGP is a layer seven OSI protocol, and it's the uh, only layer seven routing protocol. Most of the others are done on layer three. So this is basically a actual application um, running on these routers, exchanging information uh, in a message bus kind of format. So history of BGP. So. BGP wasn't around uh, when the internet sort of first started. So in 1969, UCLA sent the first internet message uh, to Stanford uh, University. And the message they sent was login, but uh, Stanford only received the LO of login. Uh, but this was considered the first successful internet message. In 1971, ARPANET, um, or the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network, uh, begins to implement a future internet protocol um, using, some pa uh, using packet switching. Um, from this research stems TCP IP um, and gives us a sort of uh, 15 nodes around the world um, for connectivity and the start of email. In 1982, um, 
the gateway to gateway protocol was developed, and this has been one of the earliest internet protocols, uh, was basically the first implementation of trying to um, build a routing system that found the fewest number of hops between a source and a destination. Um, in 1984, um, Exterior Gateway Protocol, or EGP, was formally developed. Um, and this came out in RFC 19, uh, uh, 904, sorry. The uh, protocol was actually originally created in uh, 1982, but it, got a couple, it took a couple of years uh, to get uh, formalized. So we move on, um, and in uh, 1989, um, the IETF ratifies BGP uh, v1 in the form of RFC 1105. So this changes internet routing protocols from being uh, more uh, like tree type top, uh, topologies to the modern mesh topologies we see today. Um, in 1990, we get BGP v2. Um, and then in 1993, we get BGP uh, v3. And this comes on the back of some uh, research papers that were done on algorithm analysis and experiences with BGP. Um, in 1995, we get the original version of BGP v4, which is the implementation of BGP that we see today, and not to be confused with IPv4 in any way. In um, 1995, uh, rudimentary IPv6 support was uh, added, which is sort of crazy to think that it took uh, so long for us to get uh, IPv6 support in our networks and in our internet providers. Um, and then in uh, 2006, um, the BGP, BGP v4 spec was updated, um, and we now sort of base uh, the internet off uh, RFC 4271. So that's how we got here. Um, but there are a number of things that sort of came as BGP developed, which is also uh, core to how BGP works and how um, a lot of the policy uh, behind BGP works. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have time to dig into these today, um, being a 30-minute talk, but they are worthwhile uh, digging into further. So uh, communities, uh, which certainly help simplify policy, uh, came in 1996. Multi-protocol extensions in 1998. MD5 hashing, which is unfortunately the limit of uh, security that BGP uh, provides, uh, that came in 1998. Flap damping, which is uh, really important um, for sort of maintaining the stability of the internet, uh, came in 1998. And then 32-bit AS numbers in 2007, which again, took kind of a long time to get. All right, so let's dive into the details of BGP. So firstly, we'll just look at some t uh, t terminology. Um, I've used some of it so far, but um, first one is BGP ID. Um, so basically every BGP uh, router on the internet has an, I uh, an ID, which is generally um, an IP address that's associated uh, with an interface or the loopback address of the router. A BGP speaker is any router that implements the BGP protocol. Um, an ex exchange or internet exchange is a physical network point where major providers um, connect together and exchange traffic. Um, there are definitely a number in Singapore here. Um, a BGP neighbor or peer. Um, so these are two BGP speakers that are configured to directly connect to each other. Um, a route is basically a path um, to a network. Um, transit is basically the same as a neighbor or a peer, but there um, is uh, the uh, transit uh, peer provides a full BGP routing table, um, and usually you have to pay for this. And then uh, RIB is the routing information base, which is basically the on router database that stores all of our routing information. All right, um, just uh, quickly on autonomous systems. So um, autonomous systems, or ASs, are a set of routers under um, sig signal, single technical administration. Uh, so one AS usually will belong to uh, one organization. 
Um, and within the AS, there'll be a set of IP pr uh, prefixes or subnets uh, that will be ad addressed, uh, sorry, advertised uh, to peers. Um, usually ASs have a common uh, routing policy, um, so everything, uh, each router in that AS should be presenting um, a unified front in terms of policy to its peers. And this is a registered entity um, as well. So if you uh, want to uh, route on the internet um, using BGP, you have to go and register your AS. So the BGP protocol um, is best thought about as a finite state machine, uh, which sort of actually helps um, us sort of think about how um, the protocol works. So hopefully you can all read that. Um, so the finite state machine has six different states, idle, connect, open sent, open confirm, established, and there's also active. Um, and then there are five different types of BGP messages uh, which are used in, um, in this finite state machine, which is uh, open, keep alive, notification, update, and I won't touch on it any further today, but there's also route refresh, which is a newer, um, newer type of BGP message, which I think uh, was ratified in 2006. But basically, the, um, the, way that the, uh, the way that BGP works is through this finite state machine um, and these f uh, five or six types of messages. Um, I will post my slides later, which go into, uh, I've got an appendix in here that has more details on how the finite state machine works um, in much more detail. All right, so the BGP protocol format. So um, for every BGP message, um, there is this common, um, I'm gonna call it header, um, which contains a um, marker, which is 128 bits, um, a 16-bit length field, uh, which is for the, which signifies the whole length of the BGP message, and then the type of um, BGP message. Uh, so open, update, notification, keep alive, or route refresh. And these are numbered um, one, uh, one to five. And then we have um, this message body which contains the actual message um, that um, the BGP protocol is sending. All right, so I'm gonna go through each one of these. So the first one is the uh, open message, um, which is used to help uh, establish a BGP connection. So, um, the f uh, first thing it contains is um, the uh, BGP version, uh, which is BGP4, the autonomous system number, the proposed hold time, which is basically a keep alive, the BGP identifier, uh, which is usually the IP address of the router, um, and then the length of the oper um, uh, optional parameters. So when, uh, when this open message is being sent, you have a set of uh, optional parameters, um, technically known as capabilities, that are sent along uh, with, um, during this uh, connection, or sorry, this uh, layer seven establishment um, phase, where you basically list off, you know, what are the capabilities um, of my router. And these are uh, formed in a TLV format, um, so, the parameter, it has the parameter type, uh, the parameter length, and then the parameter value. Um, and this is re repeated and you can add basically all of these to your message um, for whatever capabilities your router has. Uh, we then move on uh, to the update message. Um, so this is much more complicated and I've broken it down into a couple of slides. So once BGP uh, speakers have made contact and a link has been established, um, using the open messages, the devices began to exchange actual routing information. And uh, so each BGP uh, router, sorry, uh, each BGP router um, has routing policies to select certain routes that are advertised to its peers. Um, and then this um, information is sent uh, into BGP update messages uh, and then sent to every uh, BGP device that um, you're connected to. Um, and this is how uh, internet reachability and routing information is pr uh, propagated around the internet. So each update message contains um, w either one or both 
um, of these uh, message types, which are uh, route advertisement, which um, basically <laughs> advertises the uh, reachability of a route, or uh, route withdrawal, which is an update message to say this route is not available anymore. Uh, it's sort of important. It is important to note um, that when you send an update message, um, you can only send one advertisement um, uh, message at a time, or with uh, sorry, one adver advertisement uh, sub message within this uh, BGP update message. Um, just because you need uh, a large number of parameters um, and, and optional information, or partly uh, required, partly op optional information, and needs to be attached in this message. Um, so you only can add one uh, route advertisement message uh, in an update message, uh, but you can add as many as you like uh, remo uh, route, wi route withdrawal messages in the message. All right, so I'll look at this uh, withdrawn routes message. So it's pretty simple. Basically, you've got um, a field that says the, uh, the unfeasible routes, which is basically the number of routes that you're withdrawing. Um, um, so you've got the unfeasible routes, you've got the withdrawn routes, um, and then you've got um, basically the prefix, um, uh, the, uh, the prefix uh, for each withdrawn route, and you can sort of endlessly add to this. For the uh, update message that contains advertisements, it's um, much more, much more complicated. Um, there is basically a bunch of uh, attribute flags for a route um, added, um, and you can add various parameters um, to these uh, advertisements. It's probably too much detail for this talk, so I'm gonna skip past it. Um, but basically, you're only adding um, one, uh, one advertisement message. Uh, next one is the simplest. Uh, it's a keep alive message. Uh, which basically says, yes, I, I'm still here, um, and this works uh, in conjunction uh, with the hold time. So uh, if the hold time uh, might be a couple of seconds, you're basically sending this keep alive message every couple of seconds to say, hey, I'm, yes, I'm still here. Um, and all it is is basically the header. So it has the marker, the length of the message, and then the type. Um, so the keep alive message type is type number four, and that's all that's sent. Uh, and then, then the notification message. Uh, so during the course of the BGP session, certain error conditions um, may interfere with normal communication between BGP peers. Um, some of these uh, can be bad enough where the whole BGP session must be terminated. Um, when this occurs, the device terminating the connection will inform its peer um, of, um, about you know, what the nature of the message or the failure is. Um, and so when the session does shut down, there's a little bit of information to know like what actually happened. Um, so of course, in any error message, you need to sort of know what's going on. So there are a number of um, error codes that sort of help uh, troubleshoot. So um, you have the message header error, the open message error, update message error, hold timer error, um, uh, finite, uh, finite state machine error, um, and then the cease one, which is meant to, uh, which is actually designed for the, uh, a controlled shutdown of um, a BGP session. Um, and there's been a fair amount of work done to the cease message um, over the past couple of years. Uh, so, if you're doing maintenance on your network and you need to shut down a peer, uh, when you do that, you can actually send um, a nice message saying shutting down for maintenance number what, be back in 30 minutes or whatever. Um, and this is actually a nice upgrade um, to sort of know when my session shuts down, why is that? All right, so I've got 10 minutes left. Let's look at route building. Um, so I'm gonna just dive straight into um, sort of the basics of how our routes are built. And so BGP is based off, um, or loosely based off, the Bellman uh, Ford algorithm, uh, which basically helps build um, uh, a table of the shortest path between two vertices. So I've got a, a multi-slide uh, example here. So we're going to look at this um, 
at this routing table from primarily from the point of view of this autonomous system um, A up here. So if we look at A, it's directly connected to two peers, um, ASB and ASD. Uh, and there's, uh, as with everything in networking, uh, there is a cost, um, which is, um, for the purposes of this particular example, very arbitrary, but basically, to connect to B, uh, the cost is low. Uh, to connect to D, it's a little bit higher. Um, and there is sort of, uh, uh, and in this example, there's the no next hop, just because we're directly connected. Um, and so A sort of builds this uh, view of its directly connected world, and it distributes this information to routers B, and, uh, sorry, AS, AS's B and D. So let's look at from B now. Um, it's directly connected to three routers, A, uh, C, and E. And we've got the associated costs uh, with, those, um, uh, uh, with those connections. So B builds this table and then it sort of uh, sends that information that it has um, back to ASA. And then ASA has a uh, better view of the world. It has this sort of merged view of what it sees and what its peers see, and it now knows how to connect uh, to all of these different ASs in the network. So if we want to get from A to E, um, we've got uh, two options here. We've got, um, we can go A, B, E, uh, which is a cost of, the shortest cost is uh, five. Um, and then we've also got one, which is um, A, D, E, which is a cost of nine. Um, so obviously we'd wanna go with the lower cost in this example. Um, unfortunately, BGP, or fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, BGP is not that simple. Um, there's actually a number of sort of complex policies that make up um, uh, how routes are selected, which goes well beyond um, just the, uh, like the number of hops between um, two routers um, or the cost of those links. Um, so uh, this example is specifically for uh, Cisco, but this lists off in order basically the routing um, selection um, policy. So you can actually assign weights uh, to uh, links between two routers. So if you um, have like a, ch um, you have two connections, um, two transit providers, one's really, uh, one's like a low cost and that's good. You've got an expensive backup. Um, you know, you want to uh, set a um, higher weight um, on the uh, on the cheap one, and your traffic will uh, most likely go through there. Um, and this is just a, a local preference. Um, it, you, this information doesn't get sent to any of your peers. Um, you can also s uh, set a local preference, uh, which is basically the same thing, but you are um, uh, you are distributing that preference information with your routing uh, tables to your peers. Uh, the third one is the shortest uh, AS path, so basically the number of hops between the network. So uh, I guess by default you'd expect that to be first, but it's actually third. Um, and then there are a number of sort of um, more nuanced options, so origin type, whether that being uh, internal or external routes, um, uh, multi-exit uh, discriminator, um, again, where you can sort of do some fine tuning of um, where you want your traffic to come from. Um, I was mentioning uh, route damping earlier, which basically um, uh, looks at if a link is flapping, uh, so going up and down frequently, um, this actually impacts the CPU performance of a router like, very significantly um, to the point where it can like completely take down a network. Um, and so we've got this route damping RFC, um, but when we're looking at path select, uh, uh, route selection, um, the route age may be taken into consideration. So the longer, more stable route would be preferred. And then there's a number of other um, tie-breaking and multi-path criteria. Um, there's, I think, about six more 
Um, some of it comes down to like which is the lower IP number or the lowest uh, lower AS number. Um, it gets like completely arbitrary um, just for tie-breaking purposes. All right, so let's put this all into practice. Um, so I've got this four AS uh, network here. Um, and so uh, if I'm going from AS100 to AS400, um, I've got two links. So um, when um, each AS will prepend itself into um, the AS routing path. So you can see between uh, AS100 and AS200, 100, uh, AS100 is prepended into the path. Between AS400 uh, and AS200, um, the uh, AS200 is prepended into the path. And the same goes for uh, the bottom uh, route where we have AS300 instead of AS200. Uh, uh, and you can see that I've um, added weights here. So the top path is a weight of 20, which is the default uh, weight for a BGP peer. Um, and then I've uh, modified the uh, bottom link to be of weight 30. So um, I preference that, um, sorry, I don't preference this, I weight that higher in terms of where I want my traffic. So if I go and look at AS400, so my rightmost router, if I go and look at its routing table, um, I've got these five entries. Um, so to get to its own network, it's an internal, um, it's, an in, uh, it's an internal route, so it's just got the I. And then you can see that I've um, built uh, the paths to my other networks. Um, so if you notice um, for the bottom two rows, I've got two paths to um, the 1.1.1.0 slash 24 network, which belongs to AS100 on the left. And so how do I make a decision? So, uh, so we need to work out which one of these paths is the best path. Um, and you'll notice um, in the left-hand column here, there's um, uh, an arrow and a star. Um, so the star uh, represents a viable path that's usable. And then the uh, uh, arrow represents uh, the preferred path. Um, so in this case, uh, my preferred path is through router 300 um, and then one, uh, 100. And that's because I've set the weight to be higher. Um, so I want to send um, traffic on that link instead of uh, the other link through AS200. All right. So in conclusion, um, BGP is basically a message bus of the, of the internet. Uh, it's this layer seven protocol that just continually exchanges um, information. It scales pretty well, um, considering every single, uh, you know, uh, network that you traverse to visit any website is basically based off this protocol. Uh, so it is scaled very well. The one thing to note is full convergence is uh, not possible. Um, there are, you know, hundreds if not thousands of routing updates um, every minute. Uh, there, uh, if you look at the um, cidr.pottero.net, um, it actually has a, a list of um, offenders who have flapped uh, the most over the past week. Um, so, considering that, you know, all this routing information has to be cascaded um, between, you know, multiple uh, internet providers and ASs, um, you're never going to get full convergence. The internet's continually changing. Uh, the final thing to note here is um, getting, um, getting a BGP implementation, so a piece of BGP software uh, that supports every single feature is very difficult. Uh, so, in my research, I found that there was 186 BGP RFCs that represented a, basically 120 standards um, or um, standards that should be applied. So, getting every single piece of uh, BGP software to support all of these uh, and then get that deployed across the whole uh, internet is difficult, if not impossible. Um, so, it is very possible that, um, you know, some uh, routing devices will support things that others don't. Um, so um, if you're looking for, if you're a service provider and looking for, you know, graceful shutdown messages, um, you know, there's a good chance your other peers may not support that um, functionality. All right, so this is 12.30 on the dot, so we can probably do time for one or two questions if anyone has any. Thank you very much.
All right, thank you. Is the routing table like dynamically adjusted, or is it like somebody somebody got to update the PGP routes again? Like, to um, so if, you have if if you have a uh, like a link that's lossy, or um, you know you've got packet loss, right? Yeah. It's like any other layer seven protocol. Like data is not going to be updated, uh, and so if you know you lose that. Uh, lose the BGP session and then the underlying TCP session, um, you're basically starting that finite state machine again. Um, so all of those routes that your peers thought you were advertising, they're going to get withdrawn. Um, and then you have to, if you come back up, everything's got to sort of reconverge again. You've got to get all the routes. Um, so in terms of like flaky packet loss, um, you know, that's not something that um, BGP really does well with, like um, if you go and look at any of the service providers, especially the CDNs, uh, like they have to write very, uh, they have to write their own software to basically manage the, uh, to monitor the performance of all their transit and peering providers because the BGP protocol doesn't provide you that. So they write software where they sort of um, can go and trace out certain paths, ignoring the BGP policy that's sort of on their edge to go and look at the performance of all their, um, all their peers. If they are seeing packet loss, um, you know, they will then, uh, you know, pull, either pull down that session or, you know, um, move traffic away from it using various BGP policy mechanisms. Um, do you know uh, yeah. if there are any developments for better security? So what I mean, like, one of the specific questions I have, um, it's possible to announce that uh, <laughs> behind my autonomous system, I have a number of, you know, uh, routers and stuff like that. And yep. so then the whole internet will, you know, be collapsed for some time. Um, yeah, BGP basically has very little security. All there is is um, this MD5 hash, which is sort of like a, just a password between two BGP peers. Um, and there is nothing beyond that. There's definitely been a number of uh, attempts by the IETF for over the last, you know, 10, 15 years to implement things like BGPSEC to sort of try and lock, uh, to try and uh, create some security around what devices can announce what routes. Um, and that's like the limit of what's happened. <coughs> yeah. And so it hasn't succeeded or? Um, the short answer is no. Um, the the, one of the large challenges here is actually compute. Um, like if you go and look at uh, any sort of Cisco, Juniper, you know, any of those standard vendor routers, the CPU that those devices have is not great. Um, like they're not, they're not like um, uh, i9s or anything like that. They're like maybe one gigahertz uh, processors. Um, so uh, getting routing updates is, a very CPU, like building a full routing table for a um, service provider is not something that's trivial. And then when you go and add like cryptography on top of that, it basically makes it infeasible for those uh, devices. So um, there's not a great path forward as far as I'm aware at the moment. I think that's Thank all you. the time we have. Thank you very much, everyone.